Lauren is currently a second semester MFA student at Hunter College. Layla is working on her second year at Yale University. So Layla, in a nutshell, what was it like preparing your MFA portfolio? What's the overview of that experience? Um, so I prepared mine very quickly. I decided in a month that I wanted to apply. Um, so I had 10 images that I already had, and then I had to make 10 new images. And it was pretty frantic, but I got it done. Um, but they wanted a mixture of new and, and old work. And Lauren, what was the process like for you? Mine was a little bit the opposite of Layla's. Mm -hmm. I applied three consecutive, consecutive years and it was a very drawn out process. A lot of haggling with schools because I wanted to go for really cheap. And the actual putting things together was more like a distilling of all the work that I had while trying to make as much work as possible, but not trying to think about making a portfolio because you don't want to seem like you're applying to art school. You want to seem like you're a person with a studio practice. So I got really into my head sometimes trying to figure that all out. Yeah. And Layla, how many years did you take off in between your BFA degree and your MFA degree? Um, I just took two years off. Um, and that was a really, for me, is a sweet spot. Also, I feel like I was very lucky that it, it was the first round and I, I knew going in that that probably wasn't going to happen, but it, it was the luck of the draw. <laughs> um, but it was, it was two years for me after, uh, graduating from undergrad. And Layla, would you recommend to students to take some time off or as opposed to say going straight into the MFA from the BFA? Yeah, I definitely, definitely needed time to adjust and figure out what I wanted. I actually wasn't sure if I wanted to go back to school. Um, so that gave me some time to really solidify that the fact that I wanted to go back. Um, I have friends who went straight after undergrad and they they wish that they had a little bit of time. I mean, I found one very stressful thing for people is if they didn't have any work experience in between the BFA and the MFA, you get out with an MFA with nothing on your resume. And I did four years in between and it really helped me because I got a job immediately. I didn't have that stress of starting from scratch. Lauren, how many years exactly did you take off in between? Oh man, let's see. I think it was three or three and a half. I don't even remember now. I had a weird experience, not a weird experience, but my BFA was fairly drawn out because I had taken a couple gap years, one right after high school and then one in between RISD and going to purchase. So I was already kind of quote unquote old when I graduated. <laughs> Let's just say I started grad school when I turned 29. Yeah, and I feel like that's a pretty typical age to go, really. The average age is between, is 28, I think. So Layla, how did you know how to go about preparing the work? Because in my view, preparing a portfolio for undergrad is so different than preparing an MFA portfolio. So did you have a certain set of goals or guidelines? Was it just whatever? Like, how did you actually approach making the portfolio? Um, yeah, it was very different from undergrad. I felt like for undergrad, I was working more with um, my techniques and trying to have a diversity of materials. Um, and for graduate school, I was more working on the conceptual ideas in my work um, and building on those and kind of working on a, like, kind of a series of conceptual pieces that, that varied from each other, but had like an underlying um, conceptual link that I felt, you know, kind of strengthened the work besides just technical. Um, so that's how it's different for me for under, for uh, graduate school. Well, one thing that I tell a lot of students is look for the MFA portfolio, they don't wanna see class exercises of you doing five minute gesture drawings in charcoal for your drawing in one class. That is fine for practice, 
But the MFA portfolio is not about that. Like Lauren, how would you describe what the MFA portfolio really needs to demonstrate? So I got an experience this past semester where the students get to come together and look at portfolios for the incoming class or the applicants that are coming up next. And our say doesn't really mean a whole lot, but we do get a say. And the ones that were most intriguing were not necessarily the ones that were the most refined, technically speaking. They were the ones that had a, where you felt like after viewing it, that you wanted more. You sat there and you talked about it. You really wanted to know more about the artist. It's about showing your personality, your interests, the things that really make you tick as an artist. Well, that brings up this question is, where does technique fall into play? Because I feel that in an undergrad portfolio, like you said, Layla, that breadth of different types of media is very important. But does technique matter a lot in an MFA portfolio? I feel like it matters, but it's a mixture of the ideas. It's not as much about kind of like flexing your skills <laughs> anymore. I feel like that's what I was trying to do as an undergraduate. I had a series of, um, it was simple like self portraits and I was just trying to show that I could use oil paint basically. Um, but I think they're more interested in um, what you're thinking about um, and what kind of um, sets your work apart. Um, and it's not really about, um, can I paint you know, like hyper realistically or something like that. Um, it's more about um, your your thoughts uh, behind the process and uh, works in, in progress are also good too because they like to see um, how you work. We have a comment from Cerulean. I believe this is for Lauren. By haggling for schools, do you mean you were trying to get a cost reduction? Yes, yes. I am all for that inexpensive, cheap education. Um, for some reference, we uh, an MFA program at one of these, I guess, top schools. I, I, I was looking at, you know, the Columbia's and the RISD's and all that. It can be up to $75,000 a year. And that's given that when you're graduating, with your MFA, you are probably not going to get a job that pays that much. I wanted to go for something on the cheaper end if I could get it. So that's why I applied over several years trying to get the best deal. We have a comment from Neil. How can you have a quote, good personality? Do you need to try hard to please the admissions boards? Well, Layla, I believe you told me that you did do an in-person interview at Yale, right? Yeah, that was the most nerve wracking <laughs> experience ever, but it actually turned out to be really useful. Um, they actually had us fly um, to New Haven and meet in person with two of the professors and we set up our work um, in a kind of gallery setting. And then they just came in and asked us to speak about our work. Um, I was so nervous for this, but once the work was up, I felt like, okay, this is my work. I know it. They just want to, they just want to feel your energy. They want to, they really want to see how you're going to be um, to work with because you are working together, um, and just kind of the energy you have and that you bring to your practice. Um, I don't think it's about having a certain type of personality. I think it's just being genuine and, and honest. Um, that's that's what gets them, I think. Lauren, would you say that maybe one approach to the MFA portfolio is to create a series of artworks that are related? Or is it more haphazard? Because we did do the stream about how to create a series of artworks. Is it similar to that? Or is it different? This is a bit more of a difficult question than it first appears. So I feel like making a series is not quite the right answer. It's more like you're creating a body of work. And when I say a body of work, you're just in your studio and you're exploring your ideas. And genuinely, there is an underlying thing that you are into 
because you are a human being, you have your likes and dislikes, you have things that you like to paint. So when you're putting together your portfolio, you are distilling it. You're taking out all of the, the noise, all of the random one-off paintings that you did just uh, for fun or a painting about a, a, a meme or something or other. And you're taking the ones that are most about your, yourself really. And you're making a, a portrait of yourself as an artist out of these works. Yeah, I mean, I think some of that has to do with continuity. So we're gonna look at your work in a minute, Layla, but do you feel that the work in your MFA portfolio, that it had an overall theme or certain ideas that flowed through multiple pieces? How did that work for you in your portfolio? Yeah, it was a little bit easier on the aesthetic side rather than the, the conceptual side. I am a very shy painter. I had a hard time talking with my potential admissions people about what it was that I liked to paint, but things fell together very well in terms of pattern and texture and color. So I at least had that going for me. And I really used this being in my MFA to become a more uh, honest and upfront person about the things that I like to paint about. So we have some images here from Layla's portfolio. A lot of your work is figurative, Layla. Would you say <laughs> that there's an overall theme or is it a little bit more fragmented? Um, I think it's fragmented in the way, I, I guess I'm interested in these kind of social scenes and those scenes can be broad, but they were focused in on two to three um, kind of relationships going on at once. And I think that's what brought the work together um, in my graduate portfolio. Yeah, and I believe that you're also working in printmaking as well. So was your whole MFA portfolio, Layla, all paintings or were you doing prints at the time or drawing? Yeah, so I was living in a basement, <laughs> so I was only <laughs> making very small works, um, paintings uh, and drawings. And then I had some work from my undergrad portfolio that I could submit um, because they allow you up to three years in the past, you can submit work. Um, and there are some print, there's some prints, some drawings um, and some paintings. And I made some new paintings and drawings uh, for the portfolio. And Lauren, how about you? Was it all paintings in your portfolio or did you have other media? It was primarily painting. I did include, I, I included body painting, I think in my first year. And then in my third year, I moved over to this, this video compositing stuff with my paintings. So I would make a painting and composite on top of a video that was the same scene. And that's something that I work with more now. So it, it was a, a, a dual approach, but they were still connected aesthetically. This is a question for Layla. How would you describe the process of making your portfolio? How stressful was it? And how much work and time did you put in it? This is a good question because most people who are preparing MFA portfolios are holding down a job at the same time. and trying to live their lives. How did you balance that, Layla? Yeah, I was working in food service at the time um, and pretty pretty long hours. I was working uh, two jobs. Um, so I basically just get home and just try to sketch and the sketches then turned into larger sketches and then paintings. But I really only had these really, this really small window of time um, in the afternoons after working. And that that was difficult. Um, but I also felt like the, the kind of speed and the kind of dedicated time that I had helped me kind of um, pull out certain concepts quickly. Um, yeah, it was interesting. It was very fast uh, process. <laughs> Too fast. You know, I know a lot of art school <laughs> students complain about having deadlines, but when you get out of school, you almost crave those deadlines because a lot of us do need that pressure to really get down and get it done. So sometimes it's a good thing. 
We have a question from Anna Jolie. Why would someone want to pursue higher education with an MFA? Is it required for teaching or something? Lauren, why don't you take this one? Yes, it is required for teaching at the college level, not at the K through 12 level. And it is also, um, you also need it for doing say curatorial work, for doing art, art theory, writing, doing any of those institutional academic kind of jobs. And I will say, when you get your MFA, it's a totally different ball game. Because I remember before I got my MFA, I was really struggling a lot professionally. And when I got my MFA, first of all, all these jobs opened up because I could teach college, but also it's sort of like a stamp of approval. <laughs> it's like saying you did this, you spent the time because undergrad will certainly arm you with a lot of skills, but it's not everything. Because one thing that I think I see in both of your portfolios is not just having the voice and the vision, but also really engaging critically with your work, having that conversation. So Layla, do you want to talk about that? Like, how did you go about not just thinking about technique and, and really pushing yourself to have something to say with your work? Yeah, I think that was something um, that was really scary. Um, and I was still trying to figure out what I was, what I was doing. Uh, I knew that I was really invested in the figure um, and also, uh, you know, I started in portraiture, but I wanted to have more of a conversation um, of social issues, um, racial issues, uh, and uh, that ties into political issues too. Um, but I think that it was a time um, that I used kind of my personal experiences to try and broaden um, my scope of thinking. Um, and that's what I was thinking about when I was working on these, kind of starting at a narrow view, but then and, but then widening the lens. For sure. Lisa is saying, what is the goal of the MFA long-term, grads who represent themselves well? Well, let's talk briefly about that because the portfolio is certainly what gets you into the school, but I really think, I mean, obviously you need to apply, but I, I feel like, it's a, such a good experience preparing that portfolio because you start to realize, oh, there's more than drawing to spring semester. You start really making your mark as an artist, if that makes any sense. So Lauren, what is the goal of an MFA long-term for you in a nutshell? So the, yeah, I think, the reason I went was because I really wanted to have an experience where I was exploring my work without having these pressures of either my family or, or teachers teaching technique around. Like I really wanted to explore the ideas that I was feeling really shy about. So I'm painting a lot about being in the house, being um, a, a caregiver sometimes, uh, even just paintings of, of geese come up a lot. And I felt like I wasn't allowed to do these things. And so being in this particular community where there are a lot of other artists around me who are doing who are who are also exploring these kinds of personal issues with their work helps me become more real as a painter and more able to access those areas that I felt sometimes were rather stifled in my studio up in New Hampshire, you know, in that, in that, in my, at my home, in my, where I, where I used to live in my childhood. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people that time outside of school in between the two degrees, it's helpful because you learn how to be an artist without the structure of art school. Because in some cases for you, Lauren, it did stifle you a little bit in terms of subject matter. For me, I could not figure it out. It's like, what? I'm supposed to have a day job and pay the bills and make, like it was so hard to get myself together. So Layla, when you got out of undergrad, did you find being cut loose like that liberating or was it really hard for you? I found it super hard. Um, I I took a really long time not making anything 
um, months and months. Um, and I was just focused on um, paying the bills and paying my loans. Um, it took me a while to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it took me a while to really like, realize like whoa this is something that's really important to you um and you have to really you know kind of schedule it out art making in a way that you didn't have to in school because that's what you're scheduling around in the first place but now you're scheduling out time to make sure that you're still making um and that was super different for me yeah it's really hard i think for some people it's too much freedom too much space and so I do think that that's a good thing because in some ways when you go back to school and you're in the MFA program, you know how to use your time better because you, you've understood what it's like to try to work and maintain a studio practice at the same time. Michael is asking, did you both have the chance to talk to faculty about your portfolio and its strengths after being accepted? Lauren, why don't you answer this? Yeah, generally there's a period after being accepted where you get to then grill the school and it's your turn to, to accept them. And so some of that involves going around place to place. Like I went down to Tyler after my first year when I got accepted there and really got to talk with all the professors and be like, hey, how can you be a good fit for me? And similarly with Hunter, I got to talk with the students and be like, hey, what, you know, what, what is it like here? Is this really going to work out well? And bless you. And also in the interview process, you get to do that. Layla, I'm sure you experienced that at Yale where you got to ask questions with the professors, right? Yeah, I think it's less about um, you asking why you have been accepted and more it's, it's a mutual exchange because it's a huge decision. Um, and I think that really did help um, some of my nerves realizing that like, oh, I'm actually interviewing these professors as well. Um, and that kind of like leveled the playing field a bit, um, but it's super important. And I think the hierarchy in those situations can be um, nerve wracking, but um, there is like a mutual um, exchange going on. Cerulean is asking, is there a written component to the MFA application? If so, what was it? Lauren, what did you do? Yes, there is. You have to write a personal statement, which is a cross between an artist statement and a why you chose the school statement. And for, for me, the portfolio was really the easy part in comparison to these personal statements. I mean, a lot of artists have trouble writing, but you have to, number one, be able to talk about all the work that you just put together in this thing and string it together into something that makes sense. And then you have to somehow speak in a genuine way, even though you don't go to school yet, why it is that this school is really perfect for you and you need to be there and you have to flatter them while also sounding real about it. <laughs> you know, the only thing that's worse, you guys, is those artist grant applications. They're like, please explain why you need an artist grant. It's like, I need the money. Like, what else do I need to explain to you guys? It's really hard. Layla, what was that like for you having to write the personal statement? I'm assuming you did have to write one. It was like the hardest, one of the hardest things you've ever had to do. It was harder than making the portfolio for me um, because you just had to filter all your thoughts into this super concise, 500 words which is super short um but at the same time you're like this is really long because i don't really have the words <laughs> um but it's really important um i was working on this statement at the same time as i was doing the portfolio um and that that helped me go back and forth um and collect my ideas but it was one of the hardest pieces of writing i've ever had to do Honestly, I don't know why they make artists write. It's like, listen, if we were good at this, we would be writers. We wouldn't be artists. It's just so torturous to have to write about your work. It's very hard. Lemonaden is saying, what would be a reason for an MFA in graphic design or fields other than fine art? Yeah, it's confusing because there's so many MFA programs and they're so different from each other. For example, there are degrees in 
graphic design. I think more and more there are MFAs in illustration. Jordan just finished his in game development and character design, which is super specific. Some people it's because they did their undergrad degree at a liberal arts college. And so maybe they never had the chance to really buckle down and study graphic design, but it's complicated because it depends on the school, depends on the program. So that's really, really tricky. PKMN says, how do you go about finding the right school for you for the MFA? And actually I wanna tack on to that. Let's start with you, Lauren. Did you change your portfolio from school to school or was it the same portfolio for every school that you applied to? I changed it because schools each have a different profile and you can get a sense of what that personality or that profile is by talking to the students, checking out the student work that's coming from there, going to the open studios, looking at the professor list reading even just the statement on the website. A lot of them are the same, but you'll pick out words, co keywords that go with each place. Some places are really into the interdisciplinary or they'll mention soft sculpture or they'll mention, I don't know, painting. They'll, they'll use words that kind of key you into these certain places, the art world that you, that they are interested in. New media is another another one that shows up a lot. But looking at the Instagrams, I feel like is the most obvious thing at this point in time with COVID. And Layla, did you change your portfolio from school to school or was it the same portfolio? It was mostly the same. I think the only things that were different, I just applied to three schools, um, was just the amount of work that they wanted. Uh, so I just had to fine tune it um, and I opted for newer work uh, with those um, instances because I felt like it showed more the direction I was going. Now, there's a rule, though, that you can only submit work that's maybe two or three years old, Lauren. What was the case? Because they have rules like you can't submit work that was made 10 years ago. Right, Lauren? Yeah, Yale, I remember, has the most specific thing where you have to make work that was in the last two or three years and half of the portfolio has to be within the last year. And other schools will have requirements as far as dates go that maybe are a little bit looser, but are more or less similar. It all has to be at least within the past five years. They're really not interested in what you did 10 years ago. Layla, why do you think they have that as a guideline? Uh, I think that they can just sense, um, you can sense work that isn't recent um, and just uh, kind of honing in on, like I said before, like a direction that you're going. Um, there's just like a different uh, freshness to the work that is more um, kind of in progress and, and ongoing. Um, and I think that's important for them to see. At, at Yale, they wanted 10 uh, pieces that were from two years ago and no older, and then 10 that were in the same year. I mean, my guess is that part of it is almost a test mm -hmm. to make sure that when you're preparing your portfolio, you have an active studio practice and you didn't just go, oh, I think I'll apply. Let's toss in this stuff. I made it six years ago because that's such a big part of the MFA experience is like really knowing how to live as an artist. It is half the battle. Lauren, do you think that's true? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that and that that is really the home test that they that they make you do is can you can you actually make work because when you are in the MFA it is very well Layla I don't know about your experience but at least at Hunter it's super self directed in the sense that you have the classes that you go to but most of actually everybody that I go to school with also has a job or two jobs or three jobs and had a lot of them have kids they have a life that is not just school so what they're doing is just melding their studio practice with their life they are real and out there in the world lisa is saying i don't understand why it's hard to get into an mfa program don't they want students and their money <laughs> yes 
that is important to schools to stay alive. But Layla, do you want to explain why the MFAs are so competitive? I think, well, first of all, so many people are applying to them. So it's a really huge pool. Um, and then I think it has to do with where you are in your in your practice um and there's just like a feeling that you get when you know that you're ready that you want to teach or that you want to move up to a, a higher level um and i think that that that's just like a really competitive space i mean this was a long time ago what when i applied to graduate school in like 2002. Oh my God, that's like 18 years ago. But when I applied, I think one of the programs I applied to, it might've been Yale. I think there were 900 applications for 50 spots. Just do the math. I mean, it's as bad as wanting to go to medical school. There are just that many people. It's a hugely saturated field and there aren't a lot of spots. I mean, Lauren, how many people are enrolled in your program in your year? So, <laughs> Well, so generally speaking, MFA cohorts are are very small. Yale's is a fairly large one, I think. I, I mean, in general, for cohorts, I've seen five to ten students. Ours is a huge one, Hunters. In, in a general Hunters uh, class, it, it is supposed to be about 15, but... Um, <laughs> My particular year is, or semester is very strange. They only, we only have four people in my class and then two of them dropped out because I started around the time the pandemic started happening. So now there are two, but the class before me had 30. So they're really doing the, this numbers game where they try to accept a certain amount in order to, spit, to fill uh, a lesser amount of spots and it's all over the place, but usually they're small. Most of them I've seen are like not that big. It's not uncommon for there to be three grad students in a single year, but Layla Yale is one of the bigger programs. How many people are in your year in painting? There were 23 and now I think there's 17 um, because of the pandemic. Right, and so if you just look at those numbers, if Yale only accepts say 20 people in the painting major and there's 900 <laughs> applications. And the thing is the MFA programs, they were not always like this. I think in the nineties, it was not remotely saturated. I don't think it's remotely, it's so much more competitive now than it used to be. So it's very, very hard. Sophia is asking, do you recommend taking a gap year to strengthen my portfolio? Lauren, what do you think? Yes. Yes, definitely. Take that gap year. There, well, okay, let me say this. There are plenty of people that I know that have successfully gone on to really good MFA programs right outside of school, directly after they graduated from their BFA. But I think that most people that I have talked to, most older artists that are in the world, they always say that they wish that they did their MFA later because it's kind of like you can only do one MFA, it's usually only two years, and it's like a get out of jail free card for when you are in a rut with your, your work life and your art life, you go and you get an MFA. So use it wisely. Yeah, and also there are programs, post-baccalaureate programs, which are one-year programs, and a lot of people use those as a bridge into the MFA program, especially like if you went to a liberal arts college and you didn't have a lot of time in the studio, some people use that post back program in order to prepare the portfolio. Now let's talk a little bit about mentors and letters of recommendation because that's another part of the application to consider. And I will admit, I sometimes get letter of recommendation requests from these students totally out of the woodwork. I'm like, I don't remember you, I'm really sorry. Like, I've been teaching for so long, I can't remember if the students don't keep in touch with me. So Layla, what was that like getting the letters? Did you struggle with that or what was that like? Yeah, I had, I reached out to three professors, you included, um, that I knew I had close 
contact with and that would remember me <laughs> and um, that I had recently, you know, that we had a good experience together in their, their class. Um, and I also, I made sure to reach out as soon as possible um, because that's, that's really important because they need, they need time to prepare um, the letter. Um, but for me, it was it was three professors. I had I reached out to four, but I had to submit for three. And Lauren, how about you? What was it like getting those letters? Oh, I hate asking people for things. It was really <laughs> scary. Like I wait until not the last minute because you definitely want to give your recommender about. I think it's polite to give about a month. Some people will do it up to two or three weeks, but I think that's getting into the not so great territory. But so, yeah, similar to Layla, I asked three or four people so I would have a little bit of wiggle room in case someone couldn't do it. I had several others on my list. Yeah. I mean, those of you guys who are thinking about MFAs, I really recommend stay in touch with your teachers, even if it's just on social media, let's say you follow them on Instagram, leave a comment once every few months so they can go, oh, Lauren, okay, I remember her. Because after a while, I'm sorry, it's in one ear out the other for teachers. Like I actually did the math once. I was like, oh my God, I've had over 2000 students. Like that is a truly frightening number. You're so gonna, that, that is an important thing. You're not gonna <laughs> forget me, Clara. <laughs> of course, I'm not going to forget you guys, <laughs> but people are not as memorable as the two of you. <laughs> Michael is saying for the personal statement, how did you go about finding your voice? I always find myself struggling with being direct, but also showing some of my personality and uniqueness. Well, Layla, how did you do it? How did you get those concepts down? How did you do that? I kind of went through my practice from undergrad. Um, and I kind of started at a material place because I was still finding my concept. So I would, you know, I started with why I was drawing and then why I was printing and then why I was painting. And honestly, those are like the hardest questions, like why painting, which is like one of the prompts <laughs> in the personal statement. And I was like, I, have no idea how to answer that question. Um, but I really think like going back chronologically helped me um, and bringing in some, some anecdotal um, instances around how I created a work, um, where I was when I made something that inspired me and those kind of personal um, experiments, uh, experiences and anecdotes helped kind of um, anchor the, the statement for me. I mean, Layla, I think just the act of asking why, why am I painting? Why am I painting these people? Why this scene? Because you know something in undergrad, when people are preparing their portfolios, they oftentimes are not asking those questions. And if they are asked that question, because I do it all the time, you get a lot of answers like, well, I thought that would be cool. Well, I like, I like this. It's just cool looking. And it's like, that's not gonna fly at the MFA level. What do you think about that, Lauren? At the same time, I do want to say it is okay, it is totally okay to paint the things that you like or just the things that you think are cool. I can't tell you how often that comment has been said where, oh, it has to be more than what you like, it has to be more than this, and how that has limited my actually going in and making a picture of something that is actually, that is interesting to me. Okay, so this is how I frame it. It is okay to to paint the things that are cool, but then at some point you have to start thinking about, you, you look at your work all in your studio together and all those cool little things that you painted and you think about, wow, why did I think that that was cool? Like, what is what is interesting about this? Why am I interested in this? And then you make a statement based off of off of that. I'm really into the idea of journaling while you are making the artwork in your studio. It's a separate thing. You do your studio stuff first, then afterwards you go and you write a page where you basically debrief to yourself why you just did the things that you did or what you enjoyed about that process. That was very helpful in writing my statement. 
And Layla, when you were working on your portfolio, did you get any feedback from anybody? Did you have peers you talked to or were you really doing it on your own? I was mostly on my own. And then one of my professors actually suggested that I send them um, what I was working on, which was like a huge benefit. I wasn't expecting that. And um, she kind of guided me on what made sense to, to keep in and, and, and edit. Um, and that was really helpful. But before that, I was working on my own. Uh, and that's usually, that's usually kind of how it is. Um, and that doesn't happen all the time. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a, a just luck. And Lauren, what about you? Did you have feedback or peer support when you were getting stuff on your portfolio? Yeah, I submitted my portfolio to several of my previous teachers. Actually, I don't know if I sent it to you, but some of the people that I was getting recommendations from, they were really invested in not only just writing the recommendation, but making sure that they would never have to write a recommendation for me again for an MFA because I would actually get into the place, right? <laughs> so um, that was very helpful. And then also Eloise Sherrod guided me through the whole process on the numerous occasions that I had to do it. It's hard because there's not a lot out there as far as people getting the critical support that they need to develop a portfolio. So it's not uncommon for a lot of MFA candidates to feel that they really are navigating the waters by themselves, which leads me to say, if you guys are applying for a BFA or an MFA portfolio, we are offering free live portfolio critiques here to be done live on our YouTube channel. So if you guys want to be considered for that, I recommend that you go to artprof.org. You want to click on art critiques. And then when you go to that page, you want to click on this purple button and that's gonna take you to the submission form. So this is a free opportunity. We cannot guarantee that you'll be accepted for it, but you should submit, like you just never know because we do offer portfolio critiques for a fee and that you can do whenever you want, but this is such a great opportunity to get the lens of people that have worked in academia and know what some of the expectations are. Uh, I just wanna take this comment from Keo. I've been on an undergrad for over a decade. Didn't think after graduation I'd go for an MFA, but seriously want to try now. Could I apply with a recommendation from someone who wasn't my professor? Layla, you have an answer for that? Um, I might not have a good answer for this because I only applied with my professors. Um, but maybe, Lauren, you would? Yeah. Um, so, yes, you can. I think I asked my boss, I worked at an art job, I was a gallery manager. So I think as long as you ask someone who is in the art field, that is appropriate. I wouldn't ask someone who was, I don't know, maybe you have an accountant job and you ask that boss, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question because actually I was helping a student with recommendations and they said to me, oh, well, I should ask this person at my day job because they know me better. And I said, no, that day job has nothing to do with studio art and academia. You're actually much better asking somebody who maybe doesn't know you as well, but who is in the field. That is the most important thing because if you put down, oh, it's my boss at my retail. So like, that's not going to help you very much. In a regular job, it'd be fine. But in terms of academia, I would try to avoid that. Our prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And Lauren and I will be in the Art Prof Discord, hanging out in the post live stream channel in a little bit to chat some more. The invite link is in the video description below. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Art Prof family. And we want to give a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters who keep ArtProf up and running. And thank you to everybody who contributed to the discussion, asked questions, because that really enriches the conversation. I want to say thank you so much to Layla for coming on to the stream as a guest artist, because there's not a lot of information about this online. And it is great to have people who really know and have had that experience and can give a very up-to-date experience. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.